Hello, everybody, and I'm delighted this afternoon to have with us Carolyn Rogers, who did her Natsuki undergraduate at Cambridge and then went on to do her PhD in biological sciences and is now a patent attorney or a trainee patent attorney, I should say, with uh, Reddy and Gross in Cambridge. Um, delighted to have you with us this afternoon, Carolyn. Thanks very much for doing this. Oh, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. OK, so why don't we start by you just outlining how you came to be thinking about becoming a patent attorney? What was the what was the process of making that career choice? Yeah, so I was discussing this with some colleagues. I don't think anyone grows up necessarily dreaming of becoming a patent attorney, but um, there's no one route into the profession. Lots of people join at different stages, say after bachelor's, PhD like me, or maybe even after doing a postdoc. For me, I think I was first exposed to the profession aged about 18. I knew I wanted to study science at university, but had no idea what I wanted to do after that. And so my aunt, who at that time worked in a biotech company, put me in contact with a patent attorney and we had a chat. Um, it was not decisive at all, um, but it got the ball rolling, so to speak. Um, so when I was at Cambridge um, over my time there, I think I got um, involved in certain things to build a bigger picture um, about the profession. So I attended some talks, um, I got some work experience, and I also did an iTeams project. And I think those three things combined helped me get a good idea of what working in the profession would be like. That, that was quite fortunate for you to be able to do that iTeams experience. It is definitely a PhD-based experience, isn't it? I think I'm right in saying. Um, I think maybe master students as well. Um, master students as well. Do you want to say a little bit more just about that? Because obviously in my follow-up to students, I can highlight that as an opportunity. Just say a little bit more about that experience. Um, so um, it's a programme, I think it's run every, every term. Um, and you go once a week um, in the evenings, um, you work in a team, and basically you have a project where you're um, collaborating with an inventor, and it's about the commercialization of a new scientific product idea. So I, um, when I did it, worked on a project relating to a medical device. I think it was really interesting um, because it um, developed lots of skills that I use like in my day job now, and also the program was very well run and well organized. That was interesting, though, as well, in terms of being transferable in your interest to something that was overlapping with your subject, but perhaps something that you hadn't studied directly. No, exactly. And Do you want to say how that feeds into the thinking that is required of a patent attorney? Um, so um, we were given um, the, the medical device product um, that the inventor had invented, and we had to work out how it was different from other similar products already on the market, which is what I do in my day job now. Yes, but in terms of your imagination in spreading across different subject areas, how far do you happen to spread when you are a, a you know a trainee and then eventually a qualified patent attorney? How how broadly can you be expected to think? Um, so in terms of subject matter areas, yeah. Mm. Um, so yeah, I I work in the life sciences team, and that means that. On a daily basis, I could be doing anything from, say, chemistry to pharmaceuticals to genetic engineering and also medical devices. Um, but um, when we qualify, we also have to um, take exams that are based on mechanical um, so yeah, mechanical devices. Um, so I do have exposure to that, too. We'll come on to the exams in a minute. Uh, how do you find how do you manage to keep up with your sort of spread uh, of, of subject matter what do you find yourself typically having to do when you're coming across something new anything in particular I think working in this profession is about being a generalist not a specialist um, and I think Natsgate Cambridge gave me a broad understanding and it's sort of it, it, I sort, you sort of have a gut feeling of what things you need to check and what things you need to do a little bit more research into okay and uh just sort of you talked there about doing the um the work experience within the project at cambridge what other things help with a credible profile when you're getting ready to make applications to firms such as your own what other things do you find go down well with the with the recruiters in terms of credibility so i think um getting some experience so i was fortunate to do a work placement um, but I think most recruiters know that that's quite difficult to um, get onto, but um, different firms offer insight days. I also think it's important to show that you're interested. So maybe read about what's happening in the IP world, for example. 
How do you do that? How do you track what's happening in the IP world in particular? And um, there's lots of different blogs out there. Also, if quite a lot of um, the big stories come out on BBC News. So um, using IPCAT is the best blog, but also, you know, BBC News can be helpful too. Okay. Do you have to be able to demonstrate a general commercial awareness in a, as opposed to a specific technical comfort, shall we say? I think it's important to um, have some commercial awareness because ultimately, well, I mean, um, private practice and we work for clients and so we want to get, give them patents that help their business, not hinder them in any way. Um, so I think um, from my experience of Natsuki, I didn't get that much commercial awareness and that's where iTeams really um, help me. Um, but I would say that especially for PhD students to have a look and see if there's anything that they can get involved with um, in their departments that might have a commercial facing aspect. That's interesting. Did you have anything particular in mind putting you on the spot? Um, I personally didn't, but I know that's quite a lot of um, PhD programs are done in collaboration with industry. Um, and I think those sorts of PhD programs mm. would really help someone coming into this profession. Yeah. And I guess, again, not with you in particular, but did you know anybody who took time out to do a PhD internship, for example? Oh, some, um, yeah, some friends did PIPs um, and they, they did commercial things. Some of them did, um, I guess, science communications, which mm. also helps just sort of um, boost your CV and show that you can communicate about science. Mm. So talking about communicating about science, just give the audience an insight into the main types of skill, which it's important to show in your experience. Um, that, map, think, that, that map onto the sort of patent attorney requirements. Just give us give us a give us a shopping list of ideal skills. <laughs> so definitely communication, um, both written and verbal, um, high attention to detail, um, especially in your written communication skills, ability to problem solve, um, and also I think an ability to be interested um in the science that you're working in. And you've mentioned this before about teams what would you say about the relative importance of teams and as opposed to individual self-reliance what's the sort of balance that you strike there do you think so um it is a job where you work a lot by yourself um you have a supervising partner you may do some work in teams but it, yeah if you are the world's biggest extrovert you might find this profession a little bit lonely especially um, at the training stage um, you have to be able to motivate yourself um but a PhD at Cambridge presumably prepares you for that sort of world. Yeah, it definitely gives you that autonomy, yeah. Okay. Why don't we just move on to how to improve your chances when it comes to making an application and assessment? What sort of advice and insights would you give that uh, would stand uh, an applicant in good stead, do you think? Um, so I think it's important to prepare well for the interview. Um, that will always... Um, show and be reflected in the interview so you need to think about the kind of questions that you might be asked so um, often you're asked to describe um, say a mechanical object um, so I definitely practice doing that so describe the features of the object um, explain why it's novel why it's inventive um, maybe get a friend or a family member to pick a I don't know a kitchen utensil or a DIY tool um, and sit down and write it out this this is what's fascinating really it can be as straightforward and pragmatic as that just cruise the the supermarket shelves or an online catalog or products in you have in your house and really try to define them as a patent attorney would do yeah was there anything that particularly you were practicing on that helped you when you were describing things and just testing yourself what did you choose as an example i think um Often we use things like kitchen utensils, so um, or things like umbrellas. Um, yeah, something like that. Not too complex. Yes, I do. I do remember once when Lego bricks were quite a favourite to be used. Did you ever come across that when you were preparing? I personally for... haven't, but it would be a good one. Um, yeah. Probably more tricky than it seems initially. Yeah, that's the point, I think. It is trickier than you realise, describing in words the differences between products and particularly their uniqueness. It is it is quite a talent to acquire that. So practice does help. Um, so we've talked about the unusual nature of practising for these assessment tests, which you'll face when you go for a for interview. What about the uh, the power of networking and uh, how, that as a, as a way of improving your chances and helping you prepare? 
Um, I think it's really important to network, um, for example, through LinkedIn. Um, I think probably the best thing you can do before having an interview is just chatting with a patent attorney. Um, I, I know an interview, um, interviewers want to understand that the candidate knows what a day-to-day -day life is going to hold. Um, and it's important that applicants too understand what they're signing up for. So the best way of doing that is through networking and through finding out more about the profession that way. I think inspiring confidence in the recruiter that you know what you're getting into with this nature of the nature of using your subject, you're quite right, is very important. Students often feel hesitant about approaching people. What would you say about hesitancy? Um, don't be. Um, I think as a student, um, I was hesitant too. But now on the other side of things, I'd be very happy if someone reached out to me on LinkedIn. And without singling out your own firm in particular, Cambridge is quite well provided for with patent attorneys and a lot of those are Cambridge uh, graduates. Yeah, definitely. Um, you probably know someone who knows a patent attorney, someone, you know, um, in your institute, if you're doing a PhD or maybe in the year above, if you're an undergrad, you will know someone. OK, so we've talked about uh, uh, networking and we've talked about practising the sort of tests that you'll get um, at Assessment Centre and the skills you'll end up describing. Um, what about opportunities to develop insights in a formal way, but aren't necessarily work experiences? What's your what's your awareness of insight days and so on? Um, so personally, I, I didn't go on one, but I know that um, lots of firms do run them and they're, they're much easier to get onto um, than, say, more extended work experience. Um, so my firm's going to um, set one up for the first time this coming August. Um, and I think it's really important, um, coming back to this idea of showing that you're interested and showing that you understand what you're signing up for. That's great news to hear. So that'll be very encouraging. Is there ever an issue of problems with confidentiality? Do clients prefer that uh, students don't participate in any activities, do you find? Or do you sign non-disclosure agreements or anything like that? So I, th I think that's um, the reason why so many firms don't do extended work experiences because of the confidentiality issues. Because, yes, you, you will need to sign something to say that you're not um, sharing the information. OK. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit now, finally, about the career trajectory. And this is giving you the opportunity to say something to the audience about the exam uh, regime that, that will be facing them and it indeed is facing you at the minute. Do you want to give anybody, do you want to give the audience insights into that, uh, tackling that exam regime? Yes, so it's... Um... It's, very, it's different to law, so I think lots of people initially assume it's the same thing as becoming a solicitor, and it's not. So it's a four to five year process um, with four rounds of exams. You learn on the job um, and um, firms will support you in doing um, the, the relevant training and you'll get opportunities to take study leave. Um, yeah, the exams are notoriously difficult. Um, it's not necessarily the easiest thing, but um, I think with me um, working in private practice, there is a lot of support there for for taking those exams. How do you get yourself, how do you develop the resilience to do that? I mean, it's not something you've been accustomed to once starting the PhD. Yes. Yeah, so uh, so <laughs> how, did, how did that strike you, revisiting that sort of intense examination schedule? Um, yeah, the first exams that I did as a trainee patent attorney were, it had been a long time since my undergrad exams, but I think most people who've sat Tripos will be well prepared for sort of academically rigorous exams. Um, you just have to prepare for them um, and, and put the hours in. Yes, most people who survive Tripos seem to be prepared for almost anything that comes <laughs> along in terms of qualifications subsequently. Um, finally, just uh, can you let the audience know a little of what lies ahead of you eventually when you do qualify? What's the sort of profession that you'll have and... Um, the working life that you will have, particularly maybe a bit about work-life work balance as well, if you don't mind. But what, what, what have you got ahead of you? So um, ahead, so once you qualify, you'll become an associate and you can work up to partner level. Um, as you go up the ranks, um, there's more opportunities to um, directly communicate with the client um, and you'll do more client meetings and maybe be involved more in client portfolios. 
there's also, I guess, the option to switch and, and work in house and work for a company. There's lots more options out there than I think um, immediately meet the eye. Do many people tend to switch between firms or is it really either with the firm you qualified with and then in the house unless you're moving for geographical reasons? I think there's a bit there's a bit of both. I think um, from my experience here, most people who leave tend to leave to move um, in house. Um, but I think it might vary firm to firm. OK. And while we're coming to the end, is there anything any final words that you would offer, uh, Carolyn, to the audience listening? I would say um, definitely um, get in contact with someone who's a patent attorney. And if you can't find someone who, to chat with, um, give the IP Careers website a, a look. Um, it's very informative um, and details lots of things about exams, um, training, um, difference between in-house and private practice. That's great. As, uh, that's a great insight at the end. And I'll be sure to put the link to that particular website in the text that will accompany uh, this recording. Uh, so thanks very much for, for offering us your, your insights, Carolyn. Thank you.